Humans are fascinated by gore and violence, but even more so the mysterious and unsolved. This interest in disturbing and unpleasant subjects is called morbid curiosity, and it has gripped hundreds of people throughout the ages. I am one of those people. My name is Hallie, and this is the Morbid Curiosity Podcast. History has always been my favorite subject, even in high school. When I went to college, I moved into anthropology and archaeology, the study of the people who populate history. Through my studies, I learned all about the cradle of civilization in the Middle East, the Egyptians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Anglo-Saxons, the great medieval cities of Europe, and the more recent development of the American colonies. However, my studies lacked information about the medieval cities and towns on the east coast of Africa, cities that were just as grand and well-connected as those in Europe. The civilization along the east coast of Africa during the medieval era are known today as the Swahili coast, and one of its grandest cities was Getty. Sometime in the late 17th century, this flourishing city was mysteriously abandoned. It's a mystery I thought worth doing an episode on. The rumor that the ruins of the city are haunted by local spirits also drew my curiosity. On the coast of Kenya, in the Arabuko Sokoke Forest, lay the ruins of the ancient city of Gedi also known as Gede. I want to apologize in advance for mispronouncing any words in this episode. The city is a remnant from the medieval age of Kenya and was occupied from the 11th century to the early 17th century. At its peak, Gedi was part of an important trade route along the Swahili coast of Kenya. This trade route through the Indian Ocean stretched from Mogadishu, Somalia, to the Zambezi River in Mozambique. Over 100 settlement sites lie along this route, all belonging to the Swahili Coast culture, a single culture likely descended from the Bantu peoples of Africa with diverse local traditions that is thought to have developed into the modern Swahili culture. Recent research supports the theory that the medieval Swahili coastal sites developed from small African agricultural and fishing communities, which grew into the Swahili coast culture through trade, resulting in an increased Islamic influence during the 12th century. The increased contact between these settlements and the Islamic world led to the integration of local African and Arab traditions, creating an indigenous Swahili culture that was intensely urban and dominated by strict class structure. Early Swahili city-states followed Islam, were fairly cosmopolitan and politically independent of one another. The chief exports of these cultures were salt, slaves, ebony, gold, ivory, and sandalwood. The city-states began to decline toward the 16th century, mainly as a result of Portuguese colonialism. Eventually, the Swahili trade centers faltered, and commerce between Africa and Asia on the Indian Ocean collapsed. Before this collapse, however, many of these city-states flourished. The importance of Getty is evident in all the imported goods that have been found there, which include pottery, small items such as coins from several European countries, Venetian beads, porcelain objects from Persia, Chinese porcelain of the Ming Dynasty, and scissors from Spain. Despite its prime location and affluence, historical documentation of the city of Getty is scarce. Getty was not mentioned by the Portuguese, who occupied a town called Malindi, not 15 kilometers away, from 1512 to 1593. In fact, Gedi wasn't mentioned in Arabic or Swahili records from around the time it was inhabited. 
The city lies two miles outside Watama on the Malindi to Mombasa road, placing it close to other settlements, yet no references of the city have been found to date. Pottery from all over the world was found at Getty, suggesting it was a center for trade. Therefore, its obscurity in the record is intriguing. Excavations that took place at Getty between 1948 and 1958 reveal that the city was rebuilt twice, with new town walls in the 15th and 16th centuries, but there is no evidence of destruction due to battle. In the early 17th century, the city was suddenly abandoned for unknown reasons. We'll get to that later. The ruins of Getty were first documented by colonists in 1884, but Getty was known to the local people for years before that. Even after Sir John Kirk, a British resident of Zanzibar, visited the site, the ruins remained relatively obscure until they were rediscovered by the British East African government. Archaeological excavations began at Getty in the late 1940s. Since then, the site has remained one of the most intensely studied Swahili coast settlements. Early excavations were led by James Kirkman. Kirkman and his team started with the buildings at the city's core, and soon revealed a palace, several mosques, and several houses. They also cleared the area of trees and repaired some of the buildings. These initial excavations lasted until 1958, but became intermittent throughout the 1960s to the 1980s. The Great Mosque of Getty was excavated in 1954 and the palace in 1963. Kirkman eventually published his findings in a report called The Arab City of Getty, The Great Mosque, Architecture and Finds. Around the same time Getty was excavated, many other sites along the Swahili coast were also examined. In 1982, 116 sites along the coast were surveyed and 34 isolated ruins were found. These were theorized to be settlements and some isolated dwellings. Many of the larger settlements were excavated more extensively. After Getty, Angwana is the most studied of these settlements. It sits at the mouth of the Tana River and was similar in size to Getty. However, Getty was a denser urban center at its peak than any other settlement in the area. In the 1990s and beyond, the archaeological research at Getty and the other Swahili coastal settlements grew more intense. Research focused on the relationships between the coastal communities and their development. The results of this research challenged the earlier assumption that the development of the Swahili coast was driven by foreign influence from Arab colonists and trade with the Arab nations. Another discovery was that many of the inhabitants of Getty lived in homes built of thatch instead of stone. There were large open areas within the city that were revealed to have once contained a dense concentration of thatch buildings, most likely houses. In 2001, Stéphane Perdine from the Institut François de Archéologie Orientale and archaeologists from the National Museum of Kenya performed a topographical survey of Getty, mapping the distribution of apparent neighborhoods. They did this to try and decipher the urban development of the city. Around the same time, Lynn Coplin surveyed the Thatch House neighborhoods, focusing on the areas between the inner and outer walls Research has also been done on a group of coral stone houses built by the social elite of Getty, which are located at the urban core of the site. Through the work of archaeologists, we have some idea of what the city may have been like when it was occupied at its peak. The earliest settlements along the Swahili coast began to appear in the 6th century. 
but the earliest occupation of Gedi was likely sometime between 1041 and 1278. This time frame comes from the radiocarbon date of a grave marker in the city. The ruins of Gedi spread over about 45 acres, or 18 hectares, within the Arabuku Sokoki forest. The town was divided by two walls, an outer wall that surrounds the city, and an inner wall that surrounds 18 acres, or 7.3 hectares, within the city. The inner wall, which was 9 feet high, 18 inches thick, and coated in plaster, surrounded two mosques, four large houses, several clusters of smaller houses, and four large pillar tombs. It's not likely these inner walls were defensive in nature, as they have no significant strength. Therefore, it's more likely they were used to maintain social barriers. Archaeologists who have researched the city theorize that this inner urban center is the core of the city and likely the residence of the city's elite. The buildings are built from coral stones from the Indian Ocean, a building material that was common at the time. Between the inner and outer wall, there are two more mosques, but few other stone structures. In this ring of clear space is where the thatch houses stood when the city was still occupied. The city's infrastructure, or basic buildings and facilities needed for the operation of a society, was well-defined, with its structures formally arranged along streets that are set out in a grid pattern. There were also sumps, purposeful pits set up to collect rainwater, and toilets in many of the larger buildings. All of the buildings were a single story with walls constructed of coral stone and lime mortar. Their foundations, when present, were shallow, less than a foot deep, and no wider than the walls they supported. Some of the mosques and tombs have architectural flares, such as spandrels, the triangular part between two arches, and architraves, or beams that top a set of columns, with carvings or inlaid porcelain. Beyond the outer wall, there was another mosque, and several stone structures of unknown use. This outer wall was likely built in the 15th century. The mosques of Gedi included wells and washing facilities for cleansing prior to worship. However, they did not have minarets, the slender towers that were used to call people to prayer, a characteristic of mosques in other regions, the inner layout of the mosques of Gedi were similar to one another, with an anti-room that flanked a central room. The roof was supported by wooden beams that rested on stone pillars. The aisles created by these pillars obstructed the view of the mihrab, a niche in the wall at a point nearest to Mecca, toward which the congregation faced to pray. Two of the mosques at Gedi are classified as great mosques, but only one is known as the Great Mosque. The Great Mosque is a rectangular building within the inner wall of the city and was built in the 15th century. It had three entrances and three rows of pillars in its central room. Carvings of spear points flanked by shields adorned the spandrels of the entrances. On the eastern entrance, the architrave has been inscribed with a herringbone pattern. The residential buildings that survived are located within the inner wall. These were the houses of the elite members of society, which was just a small part of the whole population of Gedi. There are four very large houses that have been given names. The House on the Wall, the House of the Dao, the Large House, and the House on the West Wall. There are several smaller houses that surround the palace, and some of these are also named. A few of my favorites are the House of the Cistern, the House of the Venetian Bead, the House of the Iron Lamp, the House of the Sunken Court, and the House of the Well. The houses vary in size, but they follow a standard three-room plan that includes a forecourt and a domestic court, a long main room with two rooms near the back. 
One of these back rooms was usually a bedroom, and the other had storage compartments near the roof that were accessed by a trapdoor. There were also latrines in these houses, usually located near the back of the main room. Wells were also found in some of the courtyards. The entrances and configurations of the rooms are more variable, as they were built to maximize the available space in such a concentrated area of houses. One of the oldest stone houses dates to the 14th century. This is the House of the Sunken Court, and as its name suggests, it includes a long, narrow sunken court. This is different from the rest of the houses, which have wider, deeper courts, and were built in the 15th century. The palace, which is likely where the city's sheik lived, followed a similar plan to the rest of the houses in that it had a large central room with two anterooms. The two anterooms, however, had their own courtyards, and a series of residential rooms were located just off the main hall. There was also an audience court and a reception court, both accessed through different gates. The forested area around the ruined city also contains several small buildings. These consist of solitary mosques, tombs, and several houses. There are four pillar tombs at Gedi. This type of tomb was a common architectural feature of the medieval Swahili coastal settlements. These tombs have a square base decorated with recessed panels in the shape of arches. On top of these stand pillars, either octagonal or cylindrical, and are sometimes topped with a half sphere. One of these tombs within the inner wall of Gedi has a date inscribed on it in Arabic, 1399 CE. The ruins and their material culture, the personal items left by the people and later discovered by archaeologists, give great insight into the development of Swahili culture along the coast, the organization of Indian Ocean trade, the spread of Islam, and the political and economic ties between the other Swahili coast communities. Gedi was host to a very advanced society. Their city was planned. They created ways to collect water to supply themselves. They had toilets and participated in long-distance trade. For such an advanced society, it's not clear why the town was eventually deserted. Several theories have been put forward by archaeologists and anthropologists. One of these theories is that Gedi was overcome by the Portuguese army as it traveled from Mombasa on its way to attack Malindi around 1530 CE. However, as there's no record of Gedi from the Portuguese, there is little evidence for this theory. Another theory suggests that the Gala people, another powerful society who were raiding cities south of Gedi around 1600 AD, made life unbearable for the citizens of Gedi and caused them to flee. This theory could also explain the lack of riches that would have been present at Gedi. But again, there isn't any solid evidence of an attack. A third theory is that a lack of water contributed to Gedi's abandonment. One last theory proposes that some sort of epidemic hit the city, causing the residents to flee. The ruins are now open to visitors. Getty was made a historic monument in 1927 and declared a protected monument in 1929 after looters stole some of the Chinese porcelain that had been inlaid in the architectural decoration. In 1939, some of the structures at risk of collapse were restored. Further site restoration was conducted in 1948 through 1959 by James Kirkman, who was appointed warden of the site after Getty and the surrounding forest was declared a national park in 1948. In 1969, stewardship of Getty was turned over to the National Museum of Kenya, and in 2000, the construction of a museum funded by the European Union was complete and features a permanent display on Swahili culture. The modern village of Geta grew up around the ruins of Gedi. According to local tradition, the ruins are protected by the spirits of its long-departed priests. 
These spirits are called the Old Ones by the people who live in modern Geddah. The local people are reported to have always been uneasy about the ruins, due to the legend that the Old Ones will curse anyone who harms the site or takes anything from it. Gedi is also rumored to be the sinister lair of malevolent spirits. Most of these stories have come from visitors to the site, but the local unease may stem from the fact that the last occupants of the site were most likely the Gala, who were a violent and unsettled people and threatened the rest of the coastal settlements in the area. James Kirkman, the archaeologist who first excavated at Getty, said that when he first started to work amongst the ruins, he had the feeling that something or someone was watching him from behind the crumbling walls. They were neither hostile nor friendly, but seemed to be waiting for Kirkman, as if they knew he would be coming. The Swahili tradition surrounding spirits and ghosts is complex and varies depending on tribe and location. This is due to the fact that the Swahili people developed through the coalescing of many tribes that traded along the coast. Some spirits are more influenced by Middle Eastern concepts and Islamic beliefs, while others are more like African spiritual beliefs. Throughout these traditions, most spirits are harmless, but there are some that can enter into humans and cause illness, bad luck, barrenness, or other misfortunes. Relationships with spirits can take two different forms, possession or association. Usually, these relationships begin unintentionally or are the result of inheritance. The spirit is said to climb into the person and often first manifests itself as an illness. Once this happens, it is up to a spirit medium or healer to diagnose the spirit and either exorcise it or placate it. People also join spirit cults to protect themselves from these spirits or seek help once they are possessed. Because spirits are believed to be the ultimate cause of disease and illness among the Swahili, it is spirit mediums that are viewed as traditional healers within the culture. In most African cultures, including Bantu cultures from which the Swahili stem, veneration of the dead plays a prominent role. The spirits of the dead are believed to linger and have influence over the world of the living. This spiritual existence is not always considered eternal. The spirits of the dead live on as long as there is someone who remembers them. Kings and heroes who are celebrated by oral tradition live for centuries, while the spirit of common people may vanish in a few generations. A renowned ruined city could be the foothold this type of ancestral spirit needs to continue to exist in the Swahili belief system. If these spirits take any visible shape, it is often that of an animal, most often a snake, a bird, or a mantis. The dead can communicate with the living in several different ways. They can speak to people in dreams, send omens, or the spirits can be addressed by specially gifted seers. The living, through these seers, may address the dead to receive advice or ask favors. If a spirit takes offense to something a living person does, such as stealing objects from Getty, the spirit may cause that person to suffer illness or misfortune. If this happens, the seer can help that person make amends and pacify the angered spirit. Catastrophes, such as famine or war, are sometimes seen as the consequence of the serious misbehavior of a whole community. Another form of spirit in East African mythology is a shaitani. Shaitani are mostly malevolent, meaning that they wish to do harm, and are found in many different forms with different powers. Physically, shaitani can appear as various distorted human and animal figures, there is a contemporary cult for the Shaitani in East Africa, and reported sightings of individual Shaitani are cyclical, meaning they occur in predictable patterns. Modern belief in Shaitani is a continuation of pre-Islamic belief. Some peoples, such as the Segeju of Tanzania, 
who recognize eight or ten tribes of spirits, with each individual having its own name and personality, carry on the belief of shaitani possession and exorcism. According to these beliefs, there is no real way of protecting yourself from the possibility of being haunted or attacked by a shaitani. The best thing to do is stay out of their way and make sure they keep out of yours. The spirits of Gedi, be they ancestral or shaitani, have been mentioned by travel guides, Atlas Obscura, and other tourist informational materials, but specific recorded incidents are few and far between. Are these ghosts a real belief of the local people, or a rumor based on ancient beliefs being used to draw tourists to the site? Either way, the legends persist and draw people from all over the world to Getty. Ancient spaces have a way of reaching out to the human spirit. Ancient places with mysteries attached to them do this even more. Perhaps the ghosts we think haunt these places are actually our own curiosity about the people who have gone before us. These places hold history, and history is important because it allows us to understand our past, which in turn allows us to understand our present. Understanding the links between ages past and the present is the heart of understanding the condition of being human. Perhaps this need for understanding ourselves, those who came before us, and where they might have moved on to, is why these ruined places bring out the curiosity in us. The Morbid Curiosity Podcast was produced by H. Lloyd. If you'd like to get in touch or suggest a morbid topic for me to talk about, you can tweet the show at Morbid Podcast or find us on Facebook and Instagram at Morbid Curiosity Podcast. If you like the show, please share us on social media and give us a rating or subscribe on iTunes. Your shares and ratings help us grow our creepy community. Speaking of our creepy community, the MCP has joined the Belfry Podcast Network. Check out the other shows on the Belfry Network at www.thebelfry.rip. If you'd like to support the MCP, you can visit our website at www.morbidcuriositypodcast.com. A donation button, links to all of our social media, and other ways to contact us can be found there. Thank you all for your support. My name is Hallie, and until next time, thank you for listening.